Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this ARIMA genomics webinar. Um, we have two wonderful speakers joining us today, so I hope you're settling in with your favorite drink of choice for an hour of great science. Today we will have two presentations. The first will be a short introduction to 3D genomics from our SVP of Science, Anthony Schmidt, which will also set the stage for our guest speaker, Lindsay Montefiore, who will share about her lab's recent work on the functional consequences of non-coding structural alterations in pediatric leukemia. Finally, we'll wrap up with Q&A at the end, so please keep those questions coming for a very lively discussion following the presentations. All right, with that, I'd like to introduce Anthony Schmidt, our SVP of Science here at ARIMA. Under his leadership, ARIMA Genomics has launched multiple products enabling life science researchers to explore the 3D genome using a range of applications from genome assembly to translational career, cancer research and beyond. Anthony, the floor is yours. All right, uh, great. Well, uh, yeah, thank you all for joining. Um, excited to give the introduction to a wonderful talk that's gonna come after me from Dr. Lindsay Montefiore. Um, what I'll cover today in my introduction, uh, you know, half of you have, um, uh, have not been to an ARIMA genomics webinar before or are not familiar with high C technology and 3D genomics. So we'll start by just giving an, an introduction to those two things. And then following that, I wanted to just touch on some introductory concepts to how 3D genomics is being used um, in you know, cancer research. Talking initially about the mechanisms of gene, of gene regulation using 3D genomics in concert with other genomics approaches. Second, wielding 3D genomics data as a tool to identify structural variants, uh, such as gene fusions. And then what I think is super cool is then integrating both the identification of SVs and how that perturbs gene regulation in the local environment around that structural variant. And Lindsay has some really exciting data on that topic too from using uh, 3D genomics data. So what is 3D genomics? So I was introduced 3D genomics relative to what most uh, folks are familiar with, which is what I call linear genomics, which is over here on the left side of the screen, which is you know, logging into your genome browser and viewing the linear thread of the genome as a series of A's, T's, C's, and G's. 3D genomics, in contrast, is a sequencing-based uh, uh, approach that captures both the underlying sequence of the genome as well as the three-dimensional structural context of that underlying sequence, right? So we call it sequence and structure. And what's shown here is in a sort of a schematic representation, obviously, of what the genome looks like in situ within cells. And you know, really 3D genomics, I think, sits right there at the hub of providing that underlying you know, sequence information. But what's really unique about it is the information that can be uniquely gleaned from the 3D aspect of the data. And the first thing on the top is, you know, I guess I refer to it as sort of like sequencing the structure of a chromosome. You can measure the structure of a chromosome and thereby if there is a variation to the structure of a chromosome, such as an SV or a gene fusion, a technology that can measure that structure is well suited to identify variations in that structure. What's also wonderful is that by obtaining that structural information of chromosomes, you can also measure uh, interaction points between uh, promoters and enhancers and find other gene, gene regulatory information. Right? So it's a very sort of powerful tool along those axes. And what I want to start with is the gene, is the gene regulation uh, piece and just talk about how 3D genomics is an important part of a multi-omics approach to understand mechanisms of gene regulation. And where we see it sort of fitting in in that puzzle or, or sort of in the toolkit is, you know, epigenomics, you know, for example, ex explores things like, you know, chromatin state, uh, transcription factor binding, other non-coding sequence modifications like DNA methylation. A lot of, you know, you know, researchers are measuring sort of uh, phenotypic information through, through uh, you know, gene expression uh, measurements. And then 3D genomics comes in by informing those long range interactions um, that help orchestrate uh, gene, 
gene regulation. So a typical experimental design uh, would be obtaining RNA sequencing data, looking at you know, uh, differential gene expression, a taxi data, looking at you know, chromatin state or open, open chromatin, and then 3D genomics data, linking accessible regions um, at you know, promoters uh, to, uh, to enhancers or looking at the global topology of the genome and how that regulates gene expression. So what are some of the tools um, in the space that we've developed to help query the 3D genome? Well, the core technology platform and the real core technology offered at ARIMA is based on high c which stands for High Throughput Chromatin Confirmation uh, Capture, uh, invented back in 2009 in Yob, Yob Decker's lab at UMass. And at, a, at ARIMA, we've uh, commercialized high c technology and have launched you know, uh, kits or services that query the 3D genome. And the one here, over here on the left that I'm going to talk about is just uh, genome-wide HiC analysis. So looking at the 3D uh, structure of the in, of the entire genome. So uh, a genome-wide view. Then I also want to just touch on a a version of HiC, uh, which is really a targeted version of HiC called High Chip, um, which I'll go. Um, into in a second in more in more detail, and uh, Lindsay is going to talk about high chip, uh, you know, data throughout her throughout her presentation as well. And then there's some other other flavors of targeted high C that involve sequence based probe capture um, using RNA or DNA baits that can pull down, uh, you know, sequences of interest to also obtain a targeted view of particular genes or sequence elements and how those organize in 3D within the genome. So I just have a couple sort of nuts and bolts um, slides about input requirements and how how the workflow actually works. And starting with the with the uh, uh, genome wide HiC workflow, we have a a variety of different validated sample input types shown over here on the left. Um, some of them are particularly relevant for cancer research, such as uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded uh, tissues is a compatible sample type for our genome wide HiC technology, as well as uh, frozen tissues and blood. And so really the core steps of how does this technology measure the 3D genome or, or preserve information about the 3D genome in the sequencing data. And that really comes down to these first three steps that encompass the high C technology. So what we're looking at over here on the left is two pieces of DNA from the genome that are being held together in close spatial proximity but could be derived from very far apart along the linear genome. Let's say 10, 10 million base pairs away, but they have folded in such a way within the genome that now they're in close spatial proximity. And you, you really want to capture that information because it's a, it's a data point that you know, tells you something about the three-dimensional um, organization of DNA. So you have your fixed samples, and then you do really just two key steps you cut the DNA right here at these gray lines. We use a cocktail of restriction enzymes. So now you have these cut ends, which are now amenable to being re-ligated back together. So once we have the DNA cut, we fill those cut ends with a biotinylated nucleotide, and then we ligate those ends back together. And the key concept here is that these two pieces of DNA that were very far apart along the linear genome that are now held together in 3D space are also now physically joined together. So you've captured that information, you know, so to speak, that they are in close spatial proximity. Okay. Now, really the goal to sort of read this out or to sort of, you know, measure this using uh, uh, sequencing is just to purify the DNA and sequence these molecules, right? That are part dark purple, part light blue. And that one sequencing read from that molecule is, is one data point that tells you that these two pieces of DNA were in close 3D proximity. Okay. Now, for high chip technology, I want to point out just the way that it's different than genome-wide high C, and it's really just comes down to one in enrichment step. So this is just like the just like the figure that I showed you before, where first you digest the genome, you capture the spatial proximity information through through proximity ligation. But before you purify the DNA, when you have these you know, proteins 
that are facilitating these long range interactions, there you do a chromatin immunoprecipitation step. So you add your antibody that binds to a specific protein factor, you know, uh, uh, histone modification, and you enrich for those molecules that are um, associated with a particular uh, protein. So it's sort of like enriching for those interactions when that particular you know protein is is bound, right? So you can think of like H three K twenty seven acetylation and you know marker enhancer sequences, pulling out those interactions when that particular mark is on the chromatin. Okay. All right, so let's take a step back and 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 look at how you know how is this you know data type off often visualized? Well, here's a genome wide high C contact matrix uh, of a karyotypically normal sample. There's no no um, uh, cancer cells in the sample. And what you immediately see is that um, here are the chromosomes on the y-axis, and you also see the chromosomes, uh, I'm sorry, on the y-axis here and on the x-axis here. So if you're, if you captured some type of interaction that happened within uh, chromosome one, so, you know, chromosome one was interacting with some other sequence on uh, chromosome one, that data point would be one red dot within this uh, chromosome one box. And if it was chromosome one interacting with some sequence on uh, chromosome four, it would become a red dot in this box. So the color uh, is just the number of reads that you detect in the high C experiment, or you know, how often you observe an interaction between any two sequences. You can tell that intra-chromosomal interactions are by far much more frequent than inter-chromosomal uh, interactions. So all the signal is pretty much on the diagonal of this matrix in intra-chromosomal and very few in the inter-chromosomal um, space. Okay. So let's zoom in. Um, what we're looking at here is about a 700 kilobase region along chromosome two. And to help explain how to interpret these types of interaction data, let's drop four points along this IC interaction matrix. First thing that probably stands out like a sore thumb is you have these slightly off diagonal uh, points. So this right here, this high frequent interaction would be from DNA from the green space to the purple space looping together and forming that uh, 3D interaction. So you can kind of take this you know, high C map and infer uh, sort of how the you know, chromosome may be folding or you know, organized based on these data. So let's take this linear thread here with these same colored points. Well, we would expect purple and green to be kind of cinched together, and we would expect gray and blue also to be kind of cinched together. So you might have a structure that looks like this with the chromatin sort of looping out from those anchor points that form these um, uh, loops. So let's take a look at how this has been used in publications. I love, you know, I, I think this is a great example of, you know, using uh, high C data, um, learn something about gene regulation and gene misregulation in cancer. This is from the Iapontis and the Syragos lab at NYU. They apply genome-wide high C to healthy T cells as well as T cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients. What we're looking at here is a zoomed in heat map right around the MIC locus in healthy T cells. So the MIC gene kind of lives right here in this known uh, super enhancer region that's about 2 million base pairs away from MIC is in this sort of circled in region. And what's striking about this heat map in healthy T cells is that the MIC gene you can tell kind of lives within this self-interacting topological domain, sort of this triangle here on the heat map, which is separate from the super enhancer region, which is in this domain. But what's striking is when you look at the TALL cells shown here, there's almost been a, a dissolving of that barrier between those two neighboring domains, and they sort of coalesce into one larger self-interacting domain. Well, let's take a look at some of the other omics data. So if you look at CTCF uh, chip seek data, right here in the center of this region, there is a CTCF binding site in the healthy T cells. So right about 
here, which is not there in the leukemia cells. So that could explain sort of the, the you know, uh, dissolving of that barrier, right? Allowing the sort of, you know, coalescence of those two topological domains. And in the TALL cells, you see this K27 acetylation signal turn on here in this, in this super enhancer region, you know, suggesting that this, you know, boundary goes away. The super enhancer elements are now turned on in the, in the leukemia cells, and they have this sort of spatial linkage between NIC and the super enhancer region because these are all now one larger topological domain. And you see increased expression of MIC in the TALL cells. So I think even though this was a quick example, it's, I think it's a nice example of how um, 3D, gen 3D genomics informs how MIC is regulated in a healthy state, but also how it's regulated in the leukemia cells. All right, so moving on. Um, that was sort of the gene, gene regulation application, I think. Now I want to shift gears and I want to talk about using 3D genomics as a tool to identify structural variants, such as gene fusions. And just as a little vignette before I get started, I think what, what catalyzed us down this path of developing the structural variant application for 3D genomics data really started back in 2021 um, in, a, in a collaboration with NYU, where there was a... Uh, a 14-year-old girl who had a stage two uh, glioma tumor back in January of uh, 2021. It was resected. It was analyzed using the you know, gold standard DNA sequencing panels and uh, clinical RNA sequencing panels. And they weren't able to find any genetic driver of this, of this girl's uh, uh, brain tumor. Um, so it was resected and she was subject to standard chemotherapy and monitoring. But six months later, unfortunately, there was rapid progression. The tumor came back. It was sort of exploding, if you will, in, in, in terms of its size. It was resected again, analyzed with the same uh, clinical DNA and RNA sequencing panels. Again, they weren't able to identify any uh, genetic driver of this tumor. We got a hold of the FFP block of the girl's uh, uh, tumor. It was shared with us on a on a uh, research basis, we identified a novel PD ligand one fusion uh, using high C, which is incredibly rare, especially in pediatric brain tumors. Um, that PD one ligand expression was confirmed with a CLIA validated IHC test. The patient was put on uh, Keytruda, uh, PD one blockade treatment based on that result, and then. There's been no new tumor, no new uh, tumor growth since then, even as of September of uh, 2022. I think this was an incredibly powerful result for the patient and really got us thinking about the application for structural variant detection in cancer and it having potential clinical utility in the future. So let's take a step back and let's think, well, how does this technology actually work to detect gene fusions Let's first again think about the conventional, you know, DNA sequencing paradigm, uh, which is if you have a normal cell and you have no gene fusion, and you sequence that cell, what you get is like a sprinkling of reads across gene A, a sprinkling of reads across gene B. Here, and then in the conventional uh, sequencing uh, paradigm, if you have a cell that has a gene fusion, we're now chromosome A has fused to chromosome B, and it's created a fusion between gene A and gene B. What's important is that in terms of fusion detection, th those informative reads will be the ones that are right there at the breakpoint. Those DNA fragments that are comprised of part gene A and part gene B. Well, let's think about how this works with a 3D genomics approach, okay? So what, what we know is that within cells, DNA is not linear. It's organized into uh, you know, 3D folding configurations, chromosomes tend to not interact with themselves. I showed you that based on the high c data, and that's also been known from uh, chromosome painting data for, for, you know, many years. And these little blue dots here represent those cross-linking and ligation points that are detected using high c right? So let's say there's three from chromosome B, two from chromosome A, and if you portray that along a linear representation of the genome, 
on uh, chromosome A, this dot here might represent an interaction here, and then this dot here might represent an interaction here, and the same for um, uh, chromosome B. Now let's flip it to the case with a gene fusion. The key thing here is now those cross-linking and ligation points are happening between two different chromosomes that have fused together that are not normally talking to each other in 3D space, right? So if we pr project that along the linear genome, we have these reads that uh, one end maps to chromosome A, and the other end maps to the other side of the breakpoint on chromosome B. And these chromosome A or gene A to gene B type of interactions are not typically found in a characterically normal cell, okay? So of course, this is just a schematic of one cell, but you're analyzing tens or hundreds of, you know, uh, thousands of cells in a particular biopsy, each with their own set of those interactions that are happening across the breakpoint on that rearranged allele. And the ultimate effect is you have all these reads, right, that are sort of amplifying the fusion signal that aren't typically there in a karyotypically normal cell. So we try to harvest this sort of this information shown here. Right, to identify the fusion event. And just sort of the last point is, instead of just looking at the reads that are at the breakpoint, well, we can look at the reads, if you scan your eyes down, that are at the breakpoint. But the real value comes from aggregating all of the signal that is around the breakpoint, because gene A has been brought in close spatial proximity to gene B because of that gene fusion event. Right? And what this looks like on the high C heat maps as I showed you before, this is a karyotypically normal sample. Then on the right side, let's say this is chromosome four and chromosome six used together. Well, you see these exquisitely strong interactions happening between two different chromosomes, such as like right here in this box, that are not found over here. And ultimately, the, the algorithms that we use try to harvest this information uh, to look for these unexpected signals. And just real quickly, as we've been developing this technology, we've done concordance studies uh, in, in which we have compared IC technology to other gold standard technologies for finding fusions like RNA panels or fish. Um, and in all the cases where there's a known fusion, we also find that same fusion. And it's worked across a whole variety of different solid tumor and liquid tumor uh, types. Lastly, you know, this was an incredible story and we then were asking to ourselves, well, how many other patients are there out there who don't have a druggable target after gold standard DNA and RNA sequencing in a clinical setting? Well, it's a huge population of folks, almost 500,000 people in the U.S. alone with advanced cancer without a, without a identified druggable target. So what we've done is we've designed studies to really test, well, is this sort of an and of one, are, are, are we able to um, identify potentially actionable or therapeutic targets in otherwise sort of driver negative patients? So we've analyzed 221 samples uh, now um, where they have been analyzed with DNA and RNA sequencing and they didn't have an identified uh, uh, target. In 70% of them, we've identified it a fusion event associated with a gene that is the target of an FDA-approved therapy today. Now, these are largely retrospective samples, although we have a few, a few prospective cases like the pdl one example. Most of them are retrospective samples, but we do see fusions involving genes that are already targeted by FDA-approved therapies today. In about 12% of the patients, the fusions were the target of a drug in an ongoing trial, and in 29 of those patients, the fusion involved a gene that was either diagnostic or prognostic in that cancer type. So in some, about 50% of those samples, we find something that could be clinically actionable had it been in a, had it been in a prospective setting. We've analyzed, again, kind of a range of different tumor types, depending on the nature of the collaborations that we've had. We've had really good yields in sarcomas, solid hematological malignancies like lymphomas, uh, colorectal tumors, CNS tumors, and less success in tumors like uh, pancreatic tumors. And of course, we've tried to validate our results at the protein level using IH 
IHC. So kind of in the last section here, I want to talk about, I think what's really exciting is the marriage of the structural variant type of analyses and the gene regulatory type of analyses um, that you <clears throat> can do with these data. Um, and just, I think one example of that is, uh, here's a case in prostate cancer where I'm showing you the interaction landscape around a gene called ETV1 on uh, chromosome seven. I'm also showing now the interaction landscape on chromosome 14 around this gene called MyPol1. Now, there's no fusion in this normal prostate sample, right? So there's no interactions that would be happening, or very few would be happening between these two genes on two different chromosomes. Now, in the prostate cancer cells, I think what's so cool is you look at chromosome 7, you look at chromosome 14, and there is a fusion right at that point, and the expected interactions happen for across that fusion junction on that rearranged field. And you can detect those looping events using high C like they did here. And that is between this ETV1 gene promoter is forming significant loops with these other regions within an intron of MyPol1 that are marked by DNA's hypersensitivity. Just to prove that this is sort of a functional event, from Fong Wei's lab and colleagues at Northwestern can actually CRISPR out those enhancer sequences on within my pull one and see a reduction of interaction happening across the breakpoint. So reduced loop formation as well as a reduced expression of the ETV1 transcript. So thinking about sort of everything that I've said so far, we've been really trying to optimize a solution for 3D genomics and cancer research. We want to have the benefit of identifying breakpoints in a breakpoint agnostic fashion, identifying translocations, being compatible with FFPE, also detecting the promoter interactions and regulatory interactions that may impact gene, uh, gene expression. And what we've been working on is a capture-based assay that captures um, a set of cancer genes. And that capture-based assay is called the ARIMA Oncology Panel, which is currently in beta mode, which is what Lindsay has evaluated in her in her lab. And the idea here is probes around the promoter, as you can see here, to capture those promoter-based regulatory interactions, as well as probes within the gene body, right? Promoter-based interactions from the from the promoter, as well as throughout the gene body to detect those, to detect those fusion events. And just one way that we're going to you know, visualize these data is through a pot like this. So let's consider a EWSR1 fusion. Uh, shown here. Okay. The way that these data are, are visualized is through what, the, what we call these uh, Manhattan plots. And if we look at the wild type allele of Ewing sarcoma 1, that's not involved in any type of, you know, break apart or, you know, fusion event, right? Those, <clears throat> those interactions that are coming from EWSR1 on the healthy allele are interacting right with its immediate neighbors on chromosome 22, right? So there's no fusion event. All the interactions are locally around EWSR1. Now, if we consider the fused allele where part of EWSR1 has now translocated to another chromosome, well, what does that data look like in these targeted high C beta? Well, it looks like this. So we have, one part of EWSR1 interacting with its local neighbors. And then this other part of EWSR1, which has broken away and translocated somewhere else, well, it, that part of EWSR1 is interacting exquisitely high with a gene called FLE1, right? Which is the known fusion partner in this case. So that's the way that we kind of, you know, scan the genome and we say, well, what is EWSR1 used to. We know it's you know, broken apart by fish in this example. We see that fusion event too, but we also can see its exact fusion partner based on the spatial proximity and position of that gene. Right? So it's kind of like fish data in the sense that you can detect fusions by analyzing the spatial uh, positioning of genes, but it also resolves the fusion partner in ways that break the part fish doesn't. And you can hyplex this to tens to hundreds of thousands of genes in a single in a single experiment. So we're very excited about the future there. 
Um, so in summary, we think that 3D genomics is an important part of this multi-omics approach to understanding biology. In terms of SVs, it's concordant with the gold standard methods, um, and it may increase the diagnostic yield in a clinical setting um, by detecting uh, fusions that are not detected by other technologies. And with that, I will wrap up. I want to acknowledge all the collaborators that we've been you know, working with to generate the clinical data shown here, and I'll pass it back to Savannah. All right, awesome. Thank you, Anthony, for that wonderful presentation. And now I'd like to introduce Lindsay Montefiore. Lindsay received her PhD from the University of Chicago, where she studied non-coding genetic variation in cardiovascular disease. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Mulligan Lab at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, where she explores a high-risk form of leukemia called lineage ambiguous leukemia. Her research focuses on understanding how misregulated transcri sorry, transcription factors can perturb lineage commitment and lead to transformation. Lindsay, the floor is yours. All right. So I just want to thank um, Anthony and everyone at ARIMA for inviting me to share our work in this um, webinar today. So as Savannah mentioned, I'm in um, Charles Mulligan's lab at St. Jude, and our lab studies pediatric acute leukemia, and we've been using ARIMA high c technology to investigate the genetic basis of this form of leukemia as well as other forms. And so I'm um, excited to share some of those results with you today. So here I'm showing you kind of um, um, if our work can be summarized in one figure, I think it's shown here. So this is a clustering analysis of individual patient leukemia transcriptomes. So each dot that you see here represents gene expression profiling from a single patient's leukemia, and they cluster um, based on their transcriptional similarity to other cases. And so you can see a lot of these cases are clustering in these distinct regions on this uh, UMAP projection. So if I now color these cases based on their known genomic driver, you can see that these clusters correspond to specific types of alterations. A lot of these are fusion genes, but then there are also cases of specific point mutations. Um, for example, cases with a P80R mutation in the Pax5 gene. And this has uh, been a really important approach and analysis because patients with different genomic alterations tend to have different outcomes, as you can see in both pediatric and adult populations. And so understanding the genomic alteration driving the disease is really important for risk stratification, choosing appropriate therapy, um, and then uh, ultimately leading to new therapeutics. So the sort of paradigm of our lab is to go from the genomic driver use that information to develop preclinical and experimental models of the disease so that we can better understand how these different alterations are driving leukemia, and then we can develop better therapies to treat those patients. So this is great, but there are still many cases for which we do not know the genomic driver. For example, this group here, so all of the dots that are gray, it, that means that we don't know what the driver alteration is. And there are six cases in this small group here that cluster very tightly, which means that they have a very similar gene expression profile, um, but the driver is unknown. And then this group of cases up here, these include AML and TALL and lineage ambiguous leukemias. They don't cluster nearly as well as the, um, the remainder of the cases, which are BALL. And so, as I said, we, um, we still have a lot of leukemia patients that do not have a known genomic driver. And as we're learning from increased application of whole genome sequencing, there are many non-coding alterations that are affecting gene expression, and this is what's driving disease rather than mutations in protein coding sequences. And so this means that we need orthogonal approaches to just gene expression and um, protein coding region sequencing to better understand the genetic basis of those leukemias. And so today I'm going to tell you two stories. Um, both of these are recently published. Uh, but how we've used high c technology to identify the genetic mechanism activating an oncogene in two different types of leukemia. So the first is going to be on activation of the BCL11B gene through enhancer hijacking, and the second will be on a mechanism called enhancer retargeting that activates the CDX2 gene in BALL. And then I will show um, our preliminary results. We served as a um, beta tester for the new oncology capture panel that Anthony mentioned at the end of his talk. And so I'm excited to share those with you as well. 
So I'll first talk about um, acute leukemias of ambiguous lineage or broadly described as lineage ambiguous leukemia. So as you um, may or may not know, leukemia is typically classified based on its similarity to normal hematopoietic cell types. So for example, BALL is usually positive for CD19, which is a B cell, B cell marker. TALL is usually expressed CD3. This is a um, T cell marker. And acute myeloid leukemia is expressed myeloid lineage genes. This is very straightforward for most cases. Uh, but there's a relatively rare, about 2 to 5% of leukemias that cannot be um, classified into these individual categories. And that's because they express markers associated with either neither of these lineages, and those are acute undifferentiated leukemias, or they express markers associated with both the myeloid and the lymphoid lineage. And those are called mixed phenotype acute leukemias. And there's a third type of leukemia that's um, currently classified as a subtype of TALL that's called early T cell precursor acute leukemia that um, expresses T cell markers and myeloid markers, but it just differs from mixed phenotype acute leukemia by a single marker. So um, the point here is that diagnosis of these leukemias is tricky, um, but it's important to get right because that informs the choice of therapy. And this is just an example of what this looks like from a um, immunophenotypic standpoint. So this is a flow cytometry analysis of a patient with T myeloid and PAL. And you can see on the x-axis, there are cells that are positive for uh, myeloperoxidase, which is a myeloid marker. And on the y-axis, there are cells positive for CD3, the T cell marker. And so um, the prevailing hypothesis supporting this mixed lineage phenotype is that this uh, leukemia arises in a hematopoietic stem or a very early progenitor cell that retains multilineage differentiation capacity. And so in an effort to better understand the genomic alterations of this group, we recently performed a gene expression profiling analysis of over 1,000 leukemia transcriptomes. And those are all shown here. The um, dots are colored based on their original diagnosis. And for most of these cases, they had a known genomic alteration, and that's um, shown in the labels next to each of these clusters. But we found this group here comprised of about 60 cases that did not have a previously identified alteration. And the um, standout features were monoallelic expression of a gene called BCL11B. And then we performed whole genome sequencing in most of these cases. And in every single case where we had those data, we found non-coding structural variants near the BCL11B gene. So that suggested that this gene, which was not mutated in the protein coding region, could be playing a role in this subtype. So the other um, important genomic feature of this group was that most of these patients also harbored activating mutations in the FLT3 gene, and they had high FLT3 expression. So here um, I'm showing you where the breakpoints were for these structural variants. The majority of them were translocations. Um, and so each tick mark here shows where the breakpoint was on chromosome 14. And you can see that they're outside of the coding region of the gene. So in total, we identified partners of, over, of at least seven different chromosomes. And at the zoom in um, region at the bottom, you can see that these breakpoints, as I mentioned, are not in the gene. So there's no fusion gene. It's not breaking up the gene. These are occurring outside of the gene. And I'll just mention briefly that about 20% of cases did not have a translocation. Rather, they harbored this high copy tandem amplification of a 2KB region that is about um, 700 kilobases downstream of BCL11B. And I'll try to come back to that later. So we noticed that the um, partner regions were usually near these large um, H3K27 acetylation peaks, which are um, also known as super enhancers if they meet a certain threshold. And so that's highlighted very well at the most common rearrangement partner on chromosome six, which is this enhancer near the ARID1B gene. These breakpoints cluster near this enhancer and um, shown below are the partners for the remainder of the translocations that we identified. And in each case, there's a super enhancer shown in red identified at each of these um, translocation regions. So ECL1B encodes a transcription factor that's a master regulator and necessary um, factor for the specification, differentiation, and function of T cells. And within the human hematopoietic system, it's really um, quite restricted to the T lineage. It's ex not expressed in other lineages. 
But I mentioned to you that we think the cell of origin for this disease is a hematopoietic stem or early progenitor cell where there is no B sealed in the expression. And so this is what led us to hypothesize that we're seeing this monoallelic expression due to enhancer hijacking driven by these super enhancers that are at the translocation partners. And so to um, investigate that possibility, we used the H3K27 acetylation high chip approach. And so I'll just walk through what those data look like. Here, we performed high chip in healthy, normal CD34 positive cells. These are stem and progenitor cells isolated from umbilical cord blood, just as a control. On the left is the genomic region containing the bcl 11 b gene. And you can see that there's no H3K27 acetylation because this gene is repressed in this cell type. And on the right is the ARID1B enhancer uh, located on chromosome six. So you can see that this enhancer is present and it's forming long range interactions with the ARID1B gene. So if we now transition to leukemia cells from a patient that harbored the translocation between chromosome six and 14, you can see that there's really robust evidence for interchromosomal interactions. Um, in this case, it's actually the same chromosome because it's a translocation, um, but linking these enhancers to BCL11B. And if we map the data to a patient-specific reference genome, we can see the real topology. So in this case, um, we made a rearranged chromosome that Harper, that, that was the structure of this um, translocation. And this helps you really nicely visualize that the translocation places these chromosome six derived enhancers right downstream of these CL and B, and they are able to find the BCL and B promoter and activate it. And so identifying, um, we, yeah, we were able to demonstrate this um, in two additional cases um, as shown here. And so we were pretty confident that the mechanism of these the expression was through this enhancer hijacking. So identifying that bcl and b is um, the, the target of these uh, translocations and also the driver of this subtype since it's found in all of the cases is important because it now allows us to um, dig further into the biology of this disease. So for example, we can start to study the cell of origin. Um, so we can show, for example, that bcl and b is sufficient to drive expression of CD3 and otherwise extrathymic progenitor cells we can um, use this knowledge to study the mechanism by which bcl and b is disrupting gene regulation to drive transformation. And we can use this knowledge to also pursue new therapeutic options. So the second story is about um, BALL, where we have found uh, structural variations, again, that are non-coding that result in the aberrant activation of the CDX2 transcription factor. So this is uh, similar to the figure I showed in the beginning of my talk. So each, this is all BALL and each dot again is a patient sample. And you can see that there are very nice clusters for the most part. Um, and then there's this small cluster of six cases where we did not know what the genomic driver was. So we were able to acquire um, about a thousand, slightly more than a thousand more cases, which allowed us to identify in total 22 cases that clustered with this unknown subgroup. And this was good because we could then start to study what differentiates this group from the rest of the leukemias. And so a simple differential expression analysis identified that the CDX2 gene was one of the most um, significantly differentially expressed genes compared to all other BALL cases. CDX2 encodes the caudal type homeobox 2. It's a transcription factor that's expressed in the intestines, and it's important for lower GI tract formation. And again, it's um, um, not really expressed in the hematopoietic system. If you look in blood spot, you can see that there's some expression in terminal erythroid cells. So the alterations that we identified in this um, subgroup through use of whole genome sequencing were these deletions. So here I'm showing you um, the genomic region containing the CDX2 gene on the left. These black bars are the locate the um, deletion. So each, the start and end encompasses the deletion and patients for which we had um, whole genome sequencing data available. And then the green track is H3K27 acetylation from a patient with from leukemia cells from a patient with this um, type of leukemia. And so you can see that in all of these cases, the left end of the breakpoint is pretty um, strict, and it just barely goes inside of the FLT3 gene, resulting in deletion of the FLT3 promoter. 
It also encompasses the promoter of the PAN3 gene, so that whole region is deleted, but they stop short of um, deleting this intragenic uh, enhancer inside of the PAN3 gene, which I'm calling the PAN3 enhancer. And so the question is, does, do these deletions result in this enhancer being able to now skip over its normal targets, which are PAN3 and FLT3, to aberrantly activate CDX2? So before I show you those data, I want to just mention that there are two other types of structural variants that are known in this region, um, and they're, they're each interesting for their functional consequences. So it's been previously reported in BALL cases with 13Q12.2 deletions um, that there are the breakpoints for these deletions occur, they end right before the FLT3 promoter. So in this case, FLT3 is still expressed but they do delete the PAN3 promoter and they spare the PAN3 enhancer. And then the final case is actually an amplification that's observed in hypodiploid BALL, and this is just an amplification of this enhancer itself. So we have named the deletions that occur in, um, in the CDX2 group as type two deletions. Sorry, I invert, inverted those. The type one deletions are the ones that are found in um, the BALLs with um, 13, 12.2 uh, deletions, and then the enhancer amplification. So I'm going to now walk through our high chip data for each of these types of alterations. And I'll start with the control. So this is H3K27 acetylation high chip and the REH BALL cell line. So this cell line harbors an ETV6 RUNX1 translocation uh, fusion gene, but it's wild type in this region containing CDX2. And so the features to point out are that the PAN3 enhancer is here and it's looping to um, the PAN3 promoter and the FLT3 promoter, but it is not interacting with the CDX2 promoter as expected. Now in a case where there is this type two deletion that is um, found in the CDX2 cases, this unknown group that I've been um, mentioning, you can see that this um, PAN3 enhancer is now able to loop to and activate the CDX2 gene, and you see increased H3K27 acetylation signal over the gene body here. And that is because on the allele where this deletion occurs, you've removed the FLT3 promoter and the PAN3 promoter, and this results in this enhancer being released from its nor normal targets to retarget a different gene. And this mechanism of enhancer release and retargeting um, was coined in a, in a paper a couple of years ago. And then the other type of deletion where the FLT3 promoter remains intact, um, we see that the enhancer basically is able to not be bothered with one of its original targets, PAN3, and that results in its ability to interact more frequently with FLT3, and the result of this is increased um, expression of FLT3, which is an oncogene. And then finally, in cells that harbor the amplification, we see that there's both increased um, interaction with FLT3 and that we can also detect CDX2 expression in these cases. And that's shown in this example where there's contacts visible between the enhancer and CDX2. And you can see that there's um, a peak of H3K27 acetylation here. So in the normal context, when there's a single copy, that enhancer is not able to go beyond its normal targets. But once it's been duplicated, for some reason, it's now able to extend beyond its normal domain and activate a more distal gene. And I'll just end this story by mentioning that um, all of these cases also harbor another genomic alteration, which is a fusion gene uh, between that is UBTF fused to ATX in 7L3. And um, so description of this group, we were able to identify these two new genomic alterations. Um, it's also been um, simultaneously characterized by two other groups, um, but these patients have particularly poor outcomes. So it's been um, really good to identify what the driving alterations are that so we can um, start to investigate new therapeutic options. So I'll just end my talk um, by mentioning a few of the highlights from the on oncology capture panel um, from ARIMA where we use that to characterize fusion genes, um, structural variants, and non-coding regulatory events. So I think Anthony mentioned this, but the um, capture panel includes probes for over 1,400 known cancer genes. And we use this um, capture panel in um, six different um, samples that we had previously characterized by H3K27 acetylation high chip. And I'll just mention that um, you know, we follow the protocol based on how many cells to use um, to get a certain amount of chromatin and the input cell number um, is, is not in the million. So it's a, a relatively low input protocol. I'll first start by telling you the results from 
um, patient-derived xenografts of NUT M1 rearranged B ALL. So NUT, in, NUT M1 rearrangements occur in about 1% of all B ALL cases, and um, they're fusion genes involving several different partners that um, the partner genes are typically involved in chromatin regulation. And NUT M1 is an interesting gene because its expression is usually restricted to the testes. It's not meant to be expressed in leukemias. And you can see from RNA-seq data um, that the C-terminus of the NUT M1 protein is retained in all of these fusions. And so using the capture panel, we were, ab we were able to robustly identify the breakpoint of a fusion between COX-1 and chromosome 15 and NUT M1 and chromosome 7. Um, so in this case, both of these genes um, were included in the capture panel, which contributed to our ability to robustly identify them. And you can see reads um, spanning the two breakpoints shown in this box here. And then if we just zoom in and look at these two regions side by side, um, here I'm showing you the location of all of the capture probes for CUX1 on the right and for NUT M1 on the left. And you can see that you just you get really great coverage um, of the captured region. So the capture is very clean, it worked very well. And then here are the um, read pairs spanning the breakpoint. And I just want to compare that to high chip data that we have in the same sample. So you do see evidence of this translocation. And I'll just show the zoom in of um, the region showing the read pairs crossing the breakpoint. Um, but we sequenced the high chip about twofold deeper, yet we found a lot more reads spanning this breakpoint um, in the onco capture approach, approach. And I'll also show um, from the other PDX uh, sample that we have, in this case, NUT M1 is rearranged to ZNF618. And this ZNF gene is not included in the capture panel, um, but we can still detect the interaction. And so even if one of the targets uh, or fusion partners is not included in the panel, as long as one of them are, it's um, likely that you will be able to detect evidence of the translocation or the fusion. And then here is um, data from the dnd 41 ALL cell line. So this is a cell line that harbors um, a translocation that's pretty common in TALLs. So this is a, few, a translocation between chromosome 14 and chromosome 5. And in this case, the canonical T cell enhancer for BC11B is rearranged close to the TLX3 gene, wh um, which is apparently activated and is the driver in this leukemia subtype. And so the oncology capture is shown on top compared to the high chip shown on the bottom. And so, of course, the high chip is able to robustly identify this interaction because there's this strong enhancer there, and, and we're capturing the enhancer mark H3K27 acetylation. But even though the B7B enhancer was not captured in the oncology um, panel, we're able to still detect that interaction by virtue of probes that are covering TLX3. Um, and I'll just show here, I think Anthony introduced these plots, but that um, you can visualize this very um, simply in these Manhattan style plots where TLX3 is picking up BC11B and vice versa, and that it's specific. So we only see this interaction in the cells that contain the rearrangement, not in other cell lines or samples. And the last um, example I'll show is from um, the BC11B group where 20% of those cases harbored this tandem amplification downstream of BC11B. So we called this, um, this amplification the BC11B enhancer tandem amplification or beta. And here, again, we're not capturing this region at all, but you can see very clearly evidence that this is um, a tandem amplification in this sample. And so using this approach would allow you to identify this and classify it as, as a beta case. So to summarize, um, analysis of 3D genome organization can inform on the genetic mechanisms of oncogene activation. And I showed the two examples of bcl and b and lineage ambiguous leukemia and CDX2 and BALL. And the oncology capture panel does robustly identify fusion genes as well as non-coding structural variants that impact no cancer genes. And I think that's very important um, with the um, wealth of new non-coding alterations that are being discovered. So I'd just like to quickly thank the Mulligan Lab and everyone involved um, and just point out that Danica in our lab is also working on the B cell and B work, um, the NUT M1 rearranged samples were from Alari Yakabuchi, and uh, the CDX2 work was led by Shinsuke Kamura. And just thank again, Arima, for the invitation. Thanks. All right. And thank you so much, Lindsay. With that, I'd like to open the floor to questions. I see we do have a few in the chat box already. Um, so let's dive right in. Give me one sec. So it looks like the first question 
we have is 3D genomic, which means a representation of the DNA, like it is inside of the nucleus, also before cellular division or after. Whatever state in replication uh, the cells are in, when you cross-link them, it could be all different phases of the cell cycle, but I think the majority of the time the cells spend an interphase. Um, it just captures the state of that cell in that time, whether it's cells in a dish or cells in uh, tissue. So I think the question is about, are we capturing information like before division or during? It really just depends, I think, on the state that the cells are in when they get cross-linked, because that kind of like freezes the cells in space and time uh, for the high C you know, chemistry to work. So I think it just depends on what state the cells are in when you cross with them. Awesome. Our next question is, how do your high C detected SVs agree with SV detection tools designed for NGS? Isn't plain NGS cheaper than high C? So I think along those lines, what I tried to convey was, <clears throat> so far we've run about, let's say 80 or 90 samples that had no infusions using, I guess, what would be, uh, you know, existing NGS-based tools like RNA sequencing. <clears throat> and we always find the same infusions uh, that, or that we know are there based on the orthogonal uh, techniques. Then there's the question of, well, I also show data where we find things that are not found by the current tools. Um, <clears throat> and then you get into, well, are they real or not? Uh, you know, we find things that are not being found, are they real? And what, what, what we've tried to do to validate that um, at more of a functional level is to confirm that the, that the oncogenes that are involved in those fusions are being expressed uh, using IHC. So I had a slide that I went through pretty, pretty quickly. And for the targets that had IHC available, I think all of one of them had the expected oncoprotein expression or activation when that gene was associated with a fusion. There's other validation for sure that we that we still have to do, um, like breakpoint crossing PCR and things to prove that the fusion is actually there. But we've kind of jumped, I think, to the validation that the that the protein is being expressed where it shouldn't be. And then on cost, I think that's a good point. So all of the all of the genome-wide structural variant detection data that I showed, I would say on average, we target about 100 million reads or about 10x depth for genome-wide structural variant detection, which I actually think is, uh, would be cheaper than the depth you would do shotgun whole genome. But yeah, maybe Lindsay, I mean, you, I think you've done a lot of shotgun whole genome. Do you know how much depth you do for that at St. Jude? I think we usually do 600 million reads for whole genome. And I think you were saying this, Anthony, but I think like, just to reiterate and not, not you know, I, Maybe I'm coming off as biased, but with high C, you, you get so much more information to confirm a structural variant. Whereas with whole genome sequencing, mm -hmm. you have to cover the breakpoint. And so I think that's been a limitation for identifying some of these alterations is if the breakpoint's in a region that's hard to be hard to map or you just don't have sufficient depth, you're not going to find it. Yeah. And then uh, just, you know, future looking, I think on the on the panels sequencing, there's lots of you know DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing panels available today. Um, what we would like to do is kind of be in the general same ballpark in terms of the number of reads that we that would be required for that. That's going to depend on the number of genes in the panel, and we think that we could definitely be down in like the two to three million range for a reasonably small uh, future panel. Awesome. Our next question is, can you detect intrachromosomal rearrangement or only interchromosomal translocations? Yeah, intrachromosomal ones as well. Uh, excuse me, I, I don't think we've showed any examples of those, uh, but of the, of the 80 or 90 cases that we've run that had known fusions, I forget, maybe a third of them were intrachromosomal rearrangements, which are really common for like NTREC1 or BRAF, um, those can also be, be found as well. Awesome. And then our last question, 
how does the sensitivity and specificity of high c compare with optical genome mapping and detecting the non-canonical SVs? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think we've ever benchmarked to optical mapping. And I think part of the reason may just be organically, we've been looking at the clinical, like the practical clinical application in solid tumors. You know, most of our data has been in solid tumors. FFPE specifically, you know, solid tumors where optical mapping uh, is not compatible because you can't obtain high molecular weight DNA. So I think because we've been focused in the solid tumor space and on FFPE, because that's the practical sample type for most, most research, but definitely, you know, clinical use, we just haven't um, come about the uh, comparison to optical mapping. That's about all the time we have for today. So thank you folks for tuning in and shout out to those who stayed until the end of the hour. The recording of this presentation will be shared with you via email in the next couple of days. So keep your eye on your inbox and have a great rest of your week, everyone. And thank you to our speakers, Anthony and Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you.